Good morning, folks. We've got solar wind, weather, advancing solar studies, and some cosmology as well. We're watching ionized helium here in 304 angstroms, so let's start with our star at spaceweathernews.com. We find the last day with the two bright active regions continuing their rotation, coronal holes still confined to the south. That has been the case about a whole week, but the southern streams of solar wind did arrive at Earth over the last 48 hours. Telemetry is pushing 550 kilometers per second this morning, taking us from a weak to a moderate intensity stream. And even with a descent of plasma density in orange, it does remain slightly thicker than normal intensified streams. And so it combines with the moderate speed of that stream to drive minor geomagnetic instabilities yesterday and into this morning. We are near the stream's peak now. We move on to goes west. The moisture train heading at the Americas out of the Pacific is strong, driving feet of snow when it hits the coast. And look how the cloud line dips down from Alaska and then back north towards landfall. Indeed, we've got Arctic air intruding down into that dip as the jet stream does so itself and the storm flow follows the path. This is in stark contrast to the east where heat and low snow totals in Buffalo, Pittsburgh and surrounding areas have been letting them take the easy winter road thus far. But go far enough eastward and we're back to the old story. Pressure cell from the Gulf strengthens up the coast to meet lows at the northern latitudes crossing Canada and just two weeks off their record snowfalls in parts of far eastern Canada, we've got a nor'easter coming this weekend. Eyes open as she runs up the coast. Folks, we are entering a new era of space weather observation on the precipice of a new sunspot cycle. The high-resolution coronal imager, High c represents a titanic upgrade on par with the DKIS telescope we saw yesterday. Left is SDO, right is High c It might seem subtle at first, but the new scope resolves grainy magnetic fields and plasma sheets in ways that the best zoom of SDO simply cannot. And we are improving space weather observations of CMEs too. Excellent paper describing how coronal mass ejections are like snowflakes, people, and planets. No two are alike. The evolution of CME release from the sun's atmosphere determines not only the density of the shockwave impact to any planets in the way, but the magnetic character of the plasma cloud itself, not to mention the core axial filament of the CME, if it has one. Quick stop at policy here. Folks, in the last few years, we have seen both California and Australia get bitten by the bad idea bug. While halting prescribed burns not only could have prevented or mitigated the severity of both fire situations, fires are also a natural phase of the vegetation cycle, and they help the tiny life left over to sustain themselves in harmony with nature over millennia. Good read there. We're stepping out next to a binary system containing a white dwarf star and a pulsar. What's odd is the pulsar seems to be out of control, spinning and tumbling in chaotic fashion. And while the observations are being heralded as a confirmation of Einstein's gravitational space-time warp effect, a recent encounter, encounter with a third object, or aspects of the electromagnetic environment changing could cause the system to change along with it, and we'd just be catching it in that change. And we use that as a stepping stone to larger scale cosmology. More coming out on the Vera Rubin Low Surface Brightness Telescope, the woman who solidified dark matter and falsely killed plasma cosmology based on an arrogant assumption of material cataloging in the cosmos. Her namesake telescope is going to be looking for all the material around galaxies, and that's going to reveal the plasma and dust that they could not see before. Another step towards the day of epic irony, when the dusty plasma cosmology discoveries begin to bear her name. And last but not least, this can be done for galaxies, galaxy groups, or galaxy clusters, the intracluster medium at that highest scale. Our viewing of the heavens in this regard is not so much about low surface brightness, but high energy X-ray emission. These larger scale halo regions have less dust and more pure plasma. This leaves them to absorb all the starlight photoionization and reach incredible temperatures. We'd be able to do this for the Milky Way, but we're inside that X-ray forest. And so other galaxies do provide the best exterior study potential. A critical moment is on the horizon where the extent of the X-ray observations meets the low surface brightness observations to not only see which one can really see all the stuff in the cosmos, but which one dominates the large structure of these complex systems. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow.
right here, but right now it's 4.20 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.